So it's no big surprise that Thailand is a predominantly Buddhist country. Even though it's a predominantly Buddhist country, it welcomes everyone of all religions into their wonderful country. They've got synagogues, they've got temples, they've got churches. Every religion, for the most part, is welcomed here in Thailand. I myself was raised in the Christian faith. I'm still a practicing Christian. So I've always been very curious to hear from a perspective of a non-Buddhist religious leader practicing and preaching here in Thailand. Uh, so I sit down with my good friend, Father John Murray. He's a Catholic priest, been serving here in Bangkok, Thailand for the past coming up 19 years. And to hear his perspective as a Catholic priest preaching and teaching and counseling the many wonderful people here in Thailand and to hear his life perspective living here in this country for close to two decades. So let's go sit down and have a chat with Father John Murray. All right, <laughs> attempt number two. Hopefully this doesn't mess up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm here with Father John Murray. He presides over the English Catholic service at Assumption Cathedral. Sat down with Father John Murray multiple times and you know, got to hear a little bit about his life story. Uh, you've been living here for close to 19 years. Close here to Thailand. 19 years. And then you're originally from Australia. Australia, grew up in Brisbane. Like I said before, Father John and I have met multiple times. I've always been very curious about his position as a Catholic priest working and living here in Thailand, which is a predominantly Buddhist country. Uh, but before we get into all that, you know, I want to know more about Father John, his upbringing, and eventually making his way over here to Thailand. So without further ado, uh, if you don't mind uh, giving us a quick intro about your, uh, your upbringing and your life. Well, I'm Australian, born in 1956, so I'm a baby boomer, um, and um, grew up in suburban Brisbane. I finished... Uh, school in 73 so life was um i think looking back was probably um rather suburban in some ways rather ordinary but um, as i look back routine was a good thing <laughs> it helped create the person that you are uh, the routine in my life was my family the community as i experienced it through my family uh, school which was catholic and um, being part growing up in a catholic parish with my uh, parents and as that was all part of what formed me, and I went on from there to go to university, the seminary. I um, joined the religious order, the Order of St. Augustine, was ordained a priest. I spent time after ordination um, working in a parish, as a school chaplain, our school in Brisbane. I uh, worked with Vincent de Paul on a program helping homeless men deal with their issues and re-enter the community under government funding and uh, yeah, asked to come here and I've been here 19 years. That's the short end of the story. What led you to becoming a Catholic priest? Was it, I mean, do you think it was a calling from God or do you think it was uh, you know, just upbringing from your parents? Well, I can see uh, basically the combination of the two. The calling from God works um, through human reality because God's part of this reality that, that makes up who we are. So my parents were part of it, but and they were a big part of it, uh, but they weren't the full story. Um, my life began uh, in a different way, I suppose. It wouldn't happen this way now. Um, in 1956, when I was born, I discovered later on that um, my birth mother couldn't keep me because the government of the day said that she was an unworthy mother because she wasn't married and she was deaf-mute. So. I was placed in an orphanage run by the Catholic Sisters, the Mercy Sisters, and uh, my parents used to go visit the orphanage, uh, met me and adopted me when I was one. I don't know any of that, but I grew up with a great sense of uh, being gifted, of being given so much, and it all came to me through being part of the Catholic Church. And I naturally wanted to give back, and it was natural for me to give back based on my faith and um, based on uh, being part of the church, so Catholic priest. In our previous con conversations, what initially led you over here to Thailand was due to their calling on you to come over here to focus on migrant work. Well, I had my one sabbatical after so many years you do a sabbatical, so that part of my sabbatical was to come to Thailand for a few weeks, and my coming here was based on I'd always wanted to do more, work with the poor, reach out to people in need, and I wasn't being satisfied where I was in that regard. 
uh, where I was placed, assigned working in Australia. So I was always sort of reaching out, investigating. I came here, I went to visit the uh, refugee camp on the border with Jesuit Refugee Service and I felt a strong sense of calling that this is where I belong. I suppose that call stayed with me. I asked my boss, the provincial, and he eventually said yes and here I am and I stayed here. Maybe not for the same reason that I uh, first experienced, but uh, overall, yeah, for that reason. You do a lot of migrant work. You lead English service for Catholic Mass. Do you also do uh, meet up with a lot of the expats over here during your 19 years and oh. maybe give them advice or maybe any type of counseling? We have an interest in this topic. I, it's, not my, it's not my raison d'etre for being here, but I, I basically lived in the same apartment, believe it or not, and I think it must be time to move, since September, don't ask me why I remember these things, September 2006. So I'd been there for nearly 18 years, for goodness sake, that's a long time in one place. Jeez. So I think it's time to move. But anyway, because of the length of time, I've stayed there because it's central, it's secure, and I like the neighbourhood. It's a very at-home neighbourhood that's mixed Thai and Farang or Westerners. It's central. And because I've been there so long, I get to be known, and everybody knows I'm Father John. So I meet all these characters who come from my homeland and different other homelands in the West. And some have been here a long time, and some are a little bit screwed up and uh, you meet also some really great people here that I'd never meet even in downtown Sydney. Yeah. Really great characters. Anyway, so you meet a mix. Now this is kind of a, a loaded question, but for some of the characters that could be screwed up and then some of the, the good characters, Bangkok can be a pretty crazy place, let's just put it, put it that way, especially for young or an old guy. Do they suffer through a lot of vices actually being here for quite some time? I mean, I've had a couple of people over the years come to me seeking um, help. Uh, generally, I come across people because I live in the neighborhood. And then I meet these characters because um, outside my apartment building is my great friend Nando. And Nando has a sort of Italian restaurant, Thai style. So it's sort of outside and people come and go. So through Nando and other characters in my neighborhood and his restaurant, I see a lot of people and I meet people. Uh, so you see things. And I see a lot of things here I'd never see in, um, shall we say, suburban Brisbane, but that's okay. <laughs> suburban Brisbane, like I've just been there, it's a lovely place and the sky is so blue, but it's so quiet. <laughs> now meeting through all these characters, they come to you to confide to you about what's going on in their life, the potential problems. In your opinion, what do you think these are some things that they may be lacking that they need to be careful of? Like, could it be like drugs, drugs, alcohol, the women? Oh, this is a loaded question. Uh, I'm not running a social work practice and I'm not uh, running, shall we say, an illegitimate sort of service. Um, but just in meeting people, maybe trying to help some and a couple coming my way, it's just about. Um, I suppose if you're in the West and you're a little bit wayward or you're a little bit out of order and you come to Bangkok and live here, that can become much more extreme in its um, living out. It's because you have, maybe you see you have more opportunity, maybe because you don't have the same parameters or boundaries. So. Um, as I said, I meet some really great people here, incredible characters, great citizens, world citizens. But the ones you're talking about, I see one thing is they're generally disconnected. And they're disconnected, I think, at home. And that becomes doubly so living in a Bangkok. And they need to be connected. And in Australia, we would, I think you'd say, they need to have firmly rooted in the ground, but they sort of, lose that sense of being firmly rooted in the ground. They're sort of more, I suppose, out there living life. They make their choices, that's fine, but um, maybe there's more license, so um, yeah. Could it be from like a lack of family life? I think you're dealing with people, we're all broken, okay? But I think you're dealing with people who are maybe more broken or more hurt than some others. 
and maybe that's because the ones I know, they've suffered some sort of trauma at home or some sort of trauma in their lives. One was because of war service in Iraq or because of uh, mental health issues. And uh, the person in particular I'm thinking of uh, chose not to deal with those health issues, but that was part of my work at home. But at home there's more supports. So when you choose to self-medicate, instead of going to the doctor and getting medicine, you are, uh, for instance, um, well, I'll drink alcohol or I'll take drugs. When you do that here, it's much more dangerous because there's nobody really, as you might have at home, to tell you to stop it or tell you to go to the doctor. There's, there's less support and they need support. So that's one factor. When you mentioned mental health and you know mental health services, do you find mental health services here in Thailand are there's not a much much availability compared to let's say in America or in Australia? This is no judgment, but not only in Thailand, in a culture that's not of the West, there's a different approach, I think, to mental health issues. Like if I've met somebody who's studied psychology here and I can't universalize, her approach was very different. And from what I see, there's not a strong practice of uh, offering mental health services. Like, um, I've only ever seen my time, and it's named as this, psychiatric hospital, and that was in Chiang Mai. Now, I'm not saying there's not psychological services, but I'm saying it's in a different culture where it's seen in a different way, and it's less available because I th either the people can't afford it, the services, the local people, or it's not seen in the way that we see it. The approach to mental health can be coloured by culture. The other thing is I know that there are some services here, uh, like a counselling service aimed at Westerners in Bangkok, but that's aimed specifically at Westerners within the need that is arising here and it costs money. Now, Thais also suffer mental health issues, but they don't have the access to it or see it within their culture in the same way. And also, they just don't have the money to pay for such services. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. De yeah, We're dealing in different worlds in the one place. Yes. So these Western people who are here with mental health issues would be better off back home where they could get better support in the community from their families and receive the help they need medically. But they choose to come here. There isn't the same supports. They're away from their family and they could go to a doctor, to a hospital, uh, and the doctor would give them medicine. But the ones that we're talking about don't choose to do that. So that's their choice. But then choices have consequences. Yes. Such a shame that a lot of these individuals are going through this right now. But then again, life is all about choices. Yeah, and that's probably a very Western middle class uh, value. But we're talking about Westerners and they know what we're talking about. Yes. And they don't, they don't have the, um, the crutches to fall back on. Their family's way out there somewhere and maybe their family is totally alienated from them. I don't know, it could be. For yeah, I, th I think you told me a story about a friend that you knew that pretty much drank himself to death and didn't really seek out these proper uh, services and support. Well, he didn't want to. He got himself into an amount of trouble. Um, I don't want to get too graphic, but you can imagine. Um, and it's not just Bangkok, OK? Um, some guys maybe reach out further afield, Cambodia or somewhere, I don't know. But So it's not just Bangkok. But in a, in a culture, uh, this is not a licentious, it's not a culture that encourages license. It is a culture that is quite conservative, but is also a culture because of the nature, I think, of Asia and Buddhism, it allows people to be. And you get into trouble if you annoy people. And if you, well, that's the same anywhere, I suppose. And if you get into trouble, that's your doing. Um, so these, the guy I'm thinking of, um, he made a choice to come here um, and he was attracted because life wasn't working out where he was from. 
and um, yeah, he wanted. I think he had undealt dealt with issues over trauma, and so he was running away from responsibility. Chose Bangkok, and chose the bars of Bangkok. This is one particular story. Met a female at one of the bars, married her, and in the context of that story, she got all his money and used it to establish her own bar. He was, he, she then left him, he's left on his own with little money, but pursued life, continued to pursue life here, just focusing on alcohol. And when he couldn't um, buy proper alcohol, he bought the cheap Thai whiskey off the streets, uh, had strokes, and he died. I mean, it's a story that's not everybody's story, but it was his story and speaks of a downfall, his own downfall through making choices that weren't good choices. And he was able to do that in Bangkok. Yeah. And it also meant in Bangkok to the end, he had a place to live. His story, if it happened in Australia, he'd be on the street and under some government program or maybe in jail. Yeah. Okay, but that's what would happen back home. Here it was to the end, he had friends, um, he had somewhere to live, and he, uh, he died alone in hospital. It's very unfortunate. Yeah, uh, but the same stories exist back home, but they have different trajectories in a place like Bangkok. I think, especially in Thailand, it's, it just seems like a lot of the sentiments are, I guess you have more freedom, and then things are a bit more libertarian, but then there are consequences to pursuing these pursuits. Well, I will say living here, they are more libertarian within, say, his environment. But living here as a Catholic priest, um, while, while I can say um, it's the only place I live in the world where I go to my grocery store and I pass girls in bikinis on dancing poles because my food land is in a main street, which is a touristy area. Yeah. And that is true. The other side, the society, is quite conservative. Or put it another way, I could see the same young female, Thai female at the beach with her Western boyfriend in a bikini. But the same young Thai female, if she's with her Thai family at the same beach and probably not the same beach, she'll be dressed in t-shirt and shorts. Yeah. <laughs> so there are two sides or two to Thailand's and one caters to a market for a reason and I'm not laying any judgment on anybody. And part of the reason from the Thai side, if we're looking at that area, is opportunity. But definitely I'd say the society here is conservative and I've lived in other countries. I think basically people are conservative by nature. Yeah, that was a very interesting perspective. It's, it's not one size fits all. There are many, it just seems like there are many perspectives, I would say. And maybe that's the nature of Thailand too. It's accommodating. It is. Yeah, I mean, diplomatically, they're accommodating. They accommodate the Chinese, they accommodate the Americans, and they, they don't want to fight. They want to sort of make something out of it. So I don't think they're going to go to war against China, and I don't think they're going to go to war against America, but they'll happily they're, they're work they're in neutral. the world. And history shows that. They allowed the Japanese in during World War II. The Japanese asked that they declare war in America, and they said they would, but they never did. Smart. Yeah, smart. <coughs> but it had consequences. Yeah. Anyway. In contrast with your friend that fell into that lifestyle, you've also met individuals that have done very well and very successful with them, themselves. What would you say the key factor for them doing well here in Thailand? Is it because they, they have, on, on the other side of the spectrum, they are really deep in family and friend connected? They're, they're much more rooted? They're connected, but they also come here for a specific reason. Maybe it's been to pursue a career in a different context. So they, they could probably make a lot, I would say they could make a lot more money back home. So they haven't necessarily come here to make the big buck but they've come here because they want to pursue maybe their career at a greater depth or find greater opportunity within their career or there are greater challenges. So if, I know real, some real cases, 
There are people who work in NGOs with refugees, they're very talented and they could be making a big buck, buck back home, especially if they're a lawyer in New York. But they choose to come here because they want to make a difference and a contribution. Say maybe it's helping refugees or maybe it's working on migration. Or you're a lawyer and you pursue your career here because you get more opportunity to do more sorts of work you'd like to do that you can't do back home. Back home your career is slotted in this particular area, but here you get to do many more things and that's more satisfying to your career. Or a teacher, you, okay you could get maybe better money depending on the school, I don't know, uh, but you have the experience of working in a totally different context, a number would be involved uh, as volunteers part-time. Um, yeah. Has that applied to you as well, working as a Catholic priest here in Thailand where you can do much more compared to, let's say, if you were a, a priest back in your home country in Australia? Oh, definitely. I have opportunity here to do many things and do work that I think is good and that I value and that is nourishing and satisfying. And back home, um, it's a totally different scene and it's only about me. I'm making no judgment on anywhere. Uh, life as a priest in Australia for someone like me could be, it's challenging here too, could be more limiting and not allowing for because it's a totally different situation and it's more structured and in back home I'm part of the system that is. Here I'm part of the system that is but I have a certain freedom because of the jobs I have and because I'm a foreigner here and so I'm allowed the opportunity to investigate more, to go out and do different things in, in different ways, helping people. I make connections, I make contacts, and that leads to uh, new opportunities in, in mission. Would you say the ones that do well here, even though they're, they're not making the big bucks like they are back in their home country, they're more rooted in a sense of purpose? Yeah, I would say fulfillment, fulfillment, a sense of fulfillment. And I don't think I'm going to become, I, I don't think I'm going to become part of Thai society and a Thai citizen by any means. I didn't come for that. But I would say make a contribution, find your corner in the world, and here happens to be the place. And it's like anywhere else, it has its strengths and weaknesses. If it's a good place for you, it's a good place for you. If it's not, you try somewhere else. I mean, that's been. My experience, I was in Ecuador for a year and I could say, well, why didn't I stay there? Well, uh, my father got very sick at the time. I went home and I was meant to go back and my boss in the church said, no, you're not going back. I need you here. So that opportunity wasn't pursued. But an opportunity in the same, shall we say, line of work or with the same theme of justice, of helping people, reaching out to people in need, existed here and um, yeah and it's sort of evolved and developed and sometimes for very tragic reasons like now in Myanmar there's this dreadful war yeah one doesn't wish that but anyway I think the more I speak with you the more you're showing me a different life perspective of it's not a one-size-fits-all try to be more understanding many different perspectives it's not black and white it's more on the gray area. It's more gray and you don't judge anybody. Some, you don't know people's stories. And some people have very sad stories and um, Bangkok could serve to be, living here could serve to be good for them or not good for them. Yeah. But they, once again, they make their choices. One final question that I wanted to ask you is that, you know, given your not close to 19 years of experience, if you can give any proper advice to anyone watching this video right now, what would that be? Uh, maybe what I already said, you find, knowing that you find your corner in the world, and it might seem odd that it's in a place called Thailand, but if that's your corner, um, you make that your home, not as a uh, stopping off point for somewhere else, and while you're here, keep it as your home, that you feel, remain connected, that um, you keep, you keep your focus. You don't want to make life a, a, um, a uh, endurance test, but you keep your focus. Like, I came here to do something, I do it. But 
I meet great people along the way, I have some good times, I've seen some great places. There's all that. As I said before, the best bit of advice I received from an American friend who's been here since the days of the Vietnam War when he came with the Peace Corps. He said, if you want to survive in Bangkok, create your universe and invite into it those you invite. And I think that's good advice. I mean, I go up in the lift and I see some guy going up in the lift in my building. Um, I saw him going up in the elevator with three guys and I'm thinking, well, that's different, but that's his life. I live in the same building and I feel I have my home. Uh, nobody disturbs me. I don't think I disturb anybody, but stuff happens. A guy from two floors above one day a few years ago jumped and when I arrived, there's his body. Oh, Lord. Jeez. He was mental health issues. I, but all this happens around you. But it, it's not my life, it's their life. And if that's what they choose, um, I suppose good luck to them. That can help them, I do. But, and that's about it. Father John, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time to film this interview. The second time, the first time we, I screwed up big time with audio. No one's perfect, <laughs> especially the producer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But uh, if you guys are in Bangkok and you want to hear Father John, deliver English Catholic Mass. He does wonderful work. I go every Sunday. Definitely go to Assumption Cathedral at 10 a.m. You will uh, see me. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, uh, I just want to say I appreciate your time and your experience. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank Good you very on much. You. Okay.